So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes or an hour, I don't know how long I'm going to go. It could, it could be forever. Uh, but I'm going to go through uh, a bunch of different ways in which um, we've engaged, or I have engaged, or other people have engaged the audience for, for journalism. So um, kind of touching on a handful of different projects. Uh, what I hope, you know, we all go, come to these conferences, and people say smart things, and we tweet smart things, and um, then we go back to our newsrooms, and it just all goes away, right? Like, we just get caught up in the grind of everything. My goal is that if I say, if I talk about enough different ways or enough ideas that maybe something will stick and you will all go back and try that one thing. So buckle up. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that exciting. Uh, OK, so let me see. I don't like to hold a microphone because I had too much coffee. So OK, what I'm not going to be talking about is engagement as retweets or hashtags or tweet storms or Facebook shares or all this other shit that uh, a lot of newsrooms think engagement is, which it is. It, that, these are all very important things. This, this is a sense of audience growth and audience engagement, but I'm not going to be talking about that specifically. I'm going to be talking about the role that the community plays in our journalism. At ProPublica, you know, I, I worked in local environments, WDT, Detroit Public Radio. I worked at a newspaper in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So uh, from very like local ideas to very lofty national deeply investigative ideas, right? These are, these are um, all of these things, in some way, it's a methodology, right? It's not necessarily a tool or we're going after Trump. It could be simply, are your parks being maintained or can you help us fact check every member of Congress, um, uh, every letter that the member of Congress has sent to you about the AECA, right? So these are very, hopefully you can pull out a methodology as opposed to a very specific story idea. Um, so. What, when I think about engagement, I think of it as doing more and better journalism, right? Uh, be, so we can better inform our reporting, we can strengthen our stories, we can strengthen our uh, sources, we can build trust and loyal, uh, loyalty and habit and reach and audience and all of these things, these are a ladder of, of, of um, you know, a ladder of engagement, a ladder of building a larger audience, right? So like, if we have a very specific idea, we are engaging a very specific group, can we get them to trust us enough to come back to our you know, come back to our news organization, come back to our website. Can they, can we build trust enough where, and habit enough where they're not just consuming the one single thing that they care about, like if it's Agent Orange, but they're consuming everything that is on our website in some capacity. Um, how do we, these, some of these ideas will help us better collaborate and listen to our, um, to our community. And then the, this, this last point is, I think is the most important point for me is like, how do we reach the people who are truly affected by these stories? At ProPublica, um, you know, we have these big stories that are kind of focused on one particular uh, one particular audience or one particular community. Even in local environments, you have that same idea. But how do I take this thing and put it in front of them directly? The, the the people who are who are going to be impacted by what we're writing about or the issue that we're writing about, and how do they contribute or participate or or merely just see the thing? Um, it's interesting because a lot of the a lot of the method, I mean, it's not interesting, it's, it's, it's clear, right? A lot of the things that Talia was talking about are the things that I think about in terms of engagement, but where she's potentially knocking on doors and talking to a person and, and getting that person to, to, to you know, trust her or believe in her or understand the, the things that she's reporting about, we are, um, we're trying to do that in a larger scale. We're trying to do that digitally. We're not, we're, in the engagement team, we're not necessarily able to knock on doors, but how can we create an avenue in which people can feel uh, safe, uh, people can feel safe sharing their stories, and we can collect as many of those things all at the same time or in, engage with them um, in a large scale, you know, emails, uh, text campaigns, chatbots, whatever it is. So to me, engagement is journalism, right? We think about all the different tools that go into journalism. Uh, you, 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 you pick up a phone and you call a source, and that leads to more and better journalism. You, you, you file a FOIA, you get a document, and that leads to more and better journalism. Engagement is, is a tool that leads to more and better journalism. Whether we're crowdsourcing, um, we're creating a structured call out where you know, thousands of people can participate in a large investigation, whether we are uh, creating a, um, you know, a, a Facebook group where, where people who are impacted by this particular uh, uh, this particular topic can all um, join the group and talk to each other, but also talk to our reporter. 
all of these things, all of these tools are leading to uh, impact, can lead to impactful, uh, greatly, um, you know, greatly told big storytelling. Uh, so it's, remember that, engagement is journalism. So how do we do that? So I'm about to launch into a bunch of different ways in which I've done that, which other people who are smarter than me have done it. Um, actually, I think all of these examples are mine, but well, maybe not, I don't know. So um, one of the easiest ways, one of the, the, the simplest ways to, to create an avenue for your community to co talk to you or engage on a specific topic is a simple email call out. You, I guess there's a lot of students here, there's some journalists here, we should all be doing this. At the end of your story, um, you know, at the end of your stories, you should be putting a line that says, if you know anything else about this topic, get in touch with me. If you have any information about um, you know, X, Y, or Z, get in touch with me. This is a very simple uh, way for your people, the people that you're writing about, the people that you're writing for, is to, uh, to see that there is an avenue for them to participate in this thing. Uh, we do it on a regular basis. Uh, we, 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 you know, we, we did a bunch of stories about Trump's, um, you know, travel ban, and we wanted to hear specifically from people who were coming, coming from or going to the seven countries that he uh, wrote this executive order uh, about. So we created a simple email. We, we, we prominently put this call out in the stories that we were writing. We, we put it at the bottom of the stories. We, we pushed it out on social media. We pushed it out on our, our Twitter accounts. We put a uh, Twitter account, our Facebook account, all of the reporters that were involved in it. We, we pushed this out in order to get this to as many people to, so people could see this as much as possible. And we, we ended up getting over the course of on Friday when we published a story to, at 8 p.m. to me waking up at 10 a.m. the next day, we had something like 100 different emails, 100 different stories coming in. Uh, one of the things that, um, and, and, and these were ranging from people asking questions about, am I gonna be stranded in Iran for the rest of my life and I don't have any family, or I don't have any roots here. I actually live in California and I've always lived in California. Um, to, um, you know, there was a few, there were a few trolls, but most of the folks that, part, that, that emailed us were people looking for advice, people um, giving advice, people uh, telling us that if they're, you know, um, lawyers or different organizations that we could put people in touch with. And we ended up using many of these stories to further, over the course of the weekend, tell more and more and more stories, right? Uh, we would not have been able to find all of those folks without simply creating an avenue for them to get in touch with us. Um, another example of this is our Red Cross uh, investigations, and I'm not sure if any of you have seen these, this work from us, but uh, it started with, we, we got a, a tip, and the tip said something was funny with uh, Red Cross's um, finances, so we looked into it, we, we did a, a story or two, we ended up reaching out to the Red Cross, and they said that they're, they're um, that their, um, yeah, how they spent the money, how they spent the San Sandy money was a trade secret. And we said, well, that's bullshit, uh, that it's not a trade secret. And so we, you know, we kept pushing, but we asked people to, we wrote this story, this is almost a, a public shame kind of a story, and said, if you know, and, you know any information about this, get in touch with us. Uh, and from that simple email call out, uh, we ended up producing and going, you know, we ended up producing this very first Red Cross secret disaster story, which essentially said that um, the Red Cross was di diverting funds from, from actual emergency help to PR initiatives. Uh, and that would not have happened if we would not have created, simply created an avenue for someone to, to, to ask people to tell us what they knew about the Red Cross. Now this project was supposed to be a one-off story, and from that, from the trade secret story, to the email, to this Red Cross secret disaster, we ended up spending a year and a half on this. And we ended up, these are two of the most um, widely read stories that ProPublica Pro, Pro had ever. I take questions at the end, unless. Uh, that's, a, that's a different question than this presentation is, so we can talk about that, right? Uh, so we um, we ended up getting tips, and it led to this this uh, it led led to the Red Cross secret disaster, and it kept the tips ended up fueling our curiosity. It ended up showing more and more the the 
the, the opacity or, or the inability for the Red Cross to actually give us a, a straight answer. Uh, it led us to Haiti, where they ended up raising $500 billion and essentially building six homes. Uh, and that all started, this all, all of these stories ended up, uh, you know, uh, grew out of that simple email call out. Now, what was the impact of this? Uh, Gail McGovern is still the CEO of Red Cross. Uh, so, uh, you know, there hasn't been an official impact other than Chuck Grass, uh, Grassley writing a letter, but he writes letters to everybody all the time. Uh, and there is some public perception that we, we anecdotally are seeing, but uh, we have not had official impact uh, from these investigations. Um, the other thing that we do, and this is a, a lot of what Amanda and I were doing at Pro, Amanda and I focus on at ProPublica, this is a lot what I focus on at ProPublica, is crowdsourcing and sharing and, and helping us share your experiences to help us further an investigation. I think the biggest, um, the biggest story or the, the, the most successful story that we have in this so far is, uh, is um, this Agent Orange story. So I spent the better part of, uh, of, I spent all of 2016 and some of 2015 working on this with Charlie Ornstein and Mike Hixenbaugh from the Virginian Pilot. Um, and most investigative reporting, as we know, the first thing that you see that an investigative reporter has done is the biggest, is that big story, is that 10,000 word or 5,000 word story. Um, but this investigation was a little bit different and uh, where we didn't launch with a story, we launched with this question. The first thing that we published in this investigation was, can you help us investigate this issue? Uh, we launched it with a structured call out, which essentially is a form, um, you know, like a Google form. We, we, we use a tool called Screen Door, which is like Google Forms on steroids in a way, but it's essentially, you know, a way to, to structure the answers that we are asking people to participate. Um, and we, we launched this in June of 2015, uh, and as of now, the investigation has, has ended in the sense that we, we wrote our big story at the end of last year, but we ended up collecting more than 7,000 stories from veterans and their family members telling us about how Agent Orange has impacted their lives or the lives of their children. Um, and we, we wrote dozens and dozens of stories, and in those dozens and dozens of stories, we were able to use the stories that folks told us to, to, to write those, to build those, to find, sort, to find specific, um, uh, specific sources for specific topics that we were pursuing. Everything from Blue Water Navy veterans to why bladder cancer isn't on the VA's list for presumptive illnesses uh, to um, a man who basically has shaped the policy of the VA's Agent Orange program. Um, uh, uh, his, name, his name is, um, I can't remember his, Alvin Young, Dr. Alvin Young, but they call him Dr. Orange. He had a vial of Agent Orange on his desk uh, when he worked at the VA. Kind of weird, but, uh, but you know, that uh, our ability to crowdsource helped us tell these stories. Um, this is a structured call. This is essentially what, you know, what we, we launched with. This question and a bunch of, it was like 40 questions uh, that, that, that kind of, you know, asked about um, veteran experience, their families, their lives, uh, how they think they were uh, exposed to Agent Orange, what, what types of uh, benefits they get or don't get. Um, this was a substantial questionnaire. We, you know, there were something like 40 or 45 questions and we had seven, seven, more than 7,000 people fill this thing out. Um, so how do we do that? That's always the question is how do you, how do you get something like this? How do you get 7,000 people to fill out something like this? And I think it's really the, the, the crux of that last point that I said in, the, in that, bullet, you know, that bulleted list is how do you actually reach the folks that the story resonates, right? So we knew that we wanted, to go, we wanted to talk to veterans. We knew that we wanted to talk to their family members. We also knew that ProPublica doesn't necessarily have a large veteran community. We are not necessarily uh, you know, a stop where veterans are gonna go and get all of their news, right? And so um, we also knew that this community is sort of organized already. How many cities have a VFW hall or an American Legion? Uh, the, that, that culture mirrors itself on Facebook. So for every American Legion and for every VFW hall, there is a Facebook group or a Facebook page. Uh, many of these veterans form their own Facebook groups. Uh, many of these veterans uh, have, uh, have created, you know, the unit that they served in Vietnam has a Facebook group. The ship that they served on in Vietnam has a Facebook group. 
Uh, there are Facebook groups about, you know, one of the biggest one is called the VA is lying, has like 25 or 30,000 people in it. There's a bunch of different ones that says, uh, that, that are titled like, um, um, sprayed and betrayed, right? There are, all, there are uh, so many different Facebook groups that are uh, organized around this topic, and I went out and found them all. Uh, and I joined, I tried to join them all. I joined about a little less than 100 of them, and it totally changed my Facebook feed, by the way. Uh, it, but like, I had to take this story and put that thing in front of them. They were not gonna find ProPublica merely by us writing something and us tweeting it out. So, I, so if, if I was under that mentality and I started this engagement project, it would have ended up being what I would probably have considered a failure. But because I took this thing and I knew that I had to go to where they were to take it, uh, it, it the success of this project lies within this spreadsheet of, the, of me creating relationships. I'm not a veteran, but me creating relationships and, and regularly posting our stories and regularly answering questions in many of these Facebook uh, groups. Um, here's some, uh, a local, and I can we'll, we'll take questions afterward, but here, here's a local example of doing something like a, a structured call out. I also worked in, um, I said that I worked in uh, Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, and we wanted to uh, investigate blight in Harrisburg, and there's a very particular, there's a particular part of the city called Allison Hill that is um, particularly ravaged in blight. It's row houses, and so like the middle of the, middle of the row houses are blighted, but the, the houses on either end are still up, and families are still living in them. We um, wanted to investigate how, we wanted to look into how, what, what life is like, how the city reacts to these things, what, you know, what is, what is the, what, you know, what is just the general sense of this, this place, living next to blight, sending your children to, to, to um, you know, walk down the sidewalk to, uh, when a, a, a building is bombed out. Like, what is, you know, what, what happens? How do they think about it? What, 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 how do they cope with it? What are the various types of uh, advice they, you know, how, just how do they do the thing? And so we created a structured call out and uh, it asked some very specific things or some very small things. There weren't, there weren't a ton of questions, your name, your email address, give us, you know, where do you live and, you know, give us a story about your blight. Tell us about what it's like to live near or around blight. And this was with the local, this was with the local place. Uh, it wasn't, you know, we didn't have a huge watchdog team, but from this call out, I ended up leaving before we finished this project, but from this call out, they did a, a, a larger, you know, uh, a larger project on living near and around Blight and Allison Hill. Uh, and that all starts with simply creating this avenue for folks to uh, get in touch with us. Sure, we could have gone and did knock on doors, but this was a signal saying that the newspaper is re wants to talk to you. Uh, my, our reporters can't be out in the community knocking on all the doors, but we can be, you know, but you can still contribute and talk to us through this structured call out. Um, help us with the task is something that is coming up more and more now that Trump is president, and we've done a handful of projects where we are asking the community to help us with a task. Uh, one of the first ones, I think I mentioned this earlier, one of the, one of the I think the major, pro one of the most inter interesting projects that we've done this year, and yes, that is my name, and yes, it's my project, but beyond, so I might be a little bit biased, but still, I think it's very interesting. Um, we asked... Uh, we asked, we got a letter in the suggestion box of ProPublica that said, hey, I think this, um, I think this letter is wrong. I think uh, Roy Blunt from Missouri wrote a letter to a constituent. The constituent had written about the ACA. Roy responded, and the, the, the details or the, um, you know, the, 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 the data that he, the, the sentences that he put in this letter were skewed. They were, I mean, I guess we would call them lies. I don't know. Uh, so uh, she sent us an email and said, hey, can you look into this? I think these are wrong. And so we did, and then we had this idea of like, well, what if we could fact check all of the letters from all of the members of Congress that they've written to constituents about the ACA? And so we, we, we did a structured call out. I can't remember the next slide. Yeah, so we did this structured call out. Uh, we, we asked people, did you, did you write, you know, where are you from? Who's your senator representative? Did you write them about the ACA? Do you have what you wrote them? Do you have their response? Um, and then a few other questions about like their, their, what they felt about the ACA or how the ACA has impacted their lives. Uh, in, the matter of, in, in the course of two weeks, two and a half weeks, we, had, we received 800 responses. 
uh, we uh, received 500 letters and more than 250 of them were from unique members of Congress, right? So we heard from all, like more than half, I'm not good at math, a little less than half of, of the, all of the members of Congress. Um, and what we did with those is we read them all and we fact checked them all. And we ended up pulling out, um, we ended up pulling out 14 specific letters and showing that these are the, some of the more common misstatements, lies, exaggerations, or, or whatever it is. And then, you know, one of the things that we ended up doing is everybody who responded to us or everybody who's filled out this, this, um, this call out, we then sent it back to them and said, hey, we fact checked your letters. Uh, we can't, we, we, we weren't able to email them back every single letter that we fact checked, but we said, here are the 14 most common, you know, misstatements and lies. Um, we also created a public, uh, public Google Doc that showed who we have and have not heard from. In a sense, is like we can't, as reporters, say, uh, write your member of Congress about the ACA. But what we can do is say, uh, you know, we have heard from these folks, but we haven't heard from these folks. Help us out. So it's kind of like this su subversive kind of way of, um, of uh, subversive kind of way of like saying, hey, participate in this thing. Um, Here's a, a local example of helping us do a task. I, I worked at WDET for a little while, and um, we wanted to we wanted to figure out how many parks were being maintained over the summer of 2014. The mayor had said he would maintain 250 parks. I thought that was a really good number to kind of latch onto, and so we went out and we uh, said, "Hey, participate! Here is you can fill out this form." either mobily or on the website, you can text us in, you could text this number and get like five questions and tell, answer these very kind of vague, but you know, these vague questions like, does the park look like it has been mowed in the last two weeks? Do, is there lights around the park? Does the play equipment seem like, you know, is it rusted or would you let your children play on it? And we had uh, almost 200 responses. I, I, again, I left WDT before the project was done and ended up at ProPublica, but we were able to get more than two, about 200 folks to participate in this thing. Um, uh, unfortunately, again, I, this was my project, but so by the time I left, I, there was, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened to it, but um, this was uh, a, a kind of a local example of asking people to participate in a task. Um, I have 10 minutes, so uh, I'm gonna try and blow through some of these things. So creating social communities. I think this is really interesting. Uh, if you have a, a particular topic that your paper or you fo you, you're thinking about, is there a Facebook group that you can create or join um, uh, to kind of under, better understand what folks in that, that topic are talking about? These are ones that uh, we have been created. Vox did one about the ACA. This are, are, the middle one is the one that we did on patient safety. This is one that uh, Spotlight did on mental health care. Uh, th these are all around larger, larger investigations or larger kind of reporting, um, reporting projects. However, for a local example, I think, I think this is my favorite. So in Detroit, there is a group called Ladies Who Pizza. And um, at first it started, it has like 400 people in it. At first it started, I, I, I'm not, I wasn't allowed to join because I'm not a lady, but, um, it, it, you know, at first it started just like ladies talking about pizza, but now they talk about everything, right? Like they talk about their communities, they talk about news, they talk about the, the topic of the day, they talk about healthcare, they talk about all of these things. So when you're thinking about beats and you're thinking about engagement, I think this is a really good example of, uh, of finding things that are already highly engaged and joining them to try and f understand and figure out what folks are talking about. Uh, these are, I'm gonna just skip through some of that. Uh, that's WhatsApp, we did a project on WhatsApp. This is a, a Slack channel, this is a public Slack, uh, this is a Slack channel that the Washington Post did for women in tech. Um, these are just other examples of, of avenues in which you can engage folks and try and keep them engaged. Um, so there's texting, right? So this is a project, uh, this is a, a tool that I used fairly to, to, to pretty good success in a local environment um, by creating texting campaigns. This is not my project, this is a, uh, a guy I know, Ed Williams from New Mexico, he um, was doing a project on um, uh, investigating in Espanola why, th why there is such a large uh, percentage of, of opioid addiction or heroin addiction in this community specifically. Part of it was going into the school and trying to figure out what, you know, wanted to understand how this impacts the school. 
But through a ver various types of experiments and texting campaigns, he learned that the story was not necessarily how does opioid abuse affect the school, but by talking to these students and by getting them to participate in texting answers to various questions and building a community around that, he realized that the story for the high school students was not that, but was in fact, the school isn't as bad as everyone thinks it is. And, and you know, there are good things in this school. There are interesting things in this school. The students themselves are, are you know, in some ways, um, you know, frustrated with the, with the, with the, the coverage of the community uh, being kind of imposed on the students in this, in, in this particular school. I thought it was a really good example of, of going into a place, you know, building trust. Uh, he went in with a preconceived notion of what his story was and ended up figuring out that it was something completely different. I think that's a really good example for all of us. Uh, we did texting with, um, we did texting with this rent project. I have five minutes. Um, so, and then this was at voicemails. I think voicemails are highly underutilized in terms of reporting. Um, it's similar to the idea of uh, email us or text us. Um, uh, but if you have an, like this was from Washington Post, and they collected a whole bunch of stories about being pulled over. And then they, they went on to, to, to showcase some of those stories, to showcase some of the audio. It was very rich. It's very interesting. And I think this is a kind of a lo-fi way for reporters and communities to kind of uh, open up something for folks to participate in. Um, newsletters, if you're all not thinking about newsletters, you should start thinking about newsletters right now. Uh, this is a, a, an incredible avenue to not only uh, uh, get your stories out, but to create habit among folks. Uh, the people who open up your newsletter, the people who read your newsletter, are generally the, mo the most uh, loyal and the most habit-forming folks. So, but don't think about newsletters in the sense of a daily newsletter, I mean, which is fine, or a weekly newsletter. What about newsletters within beats, right? What about newsletters within topics? This particular one is a, what we, was called a pop-up newsletter. It pop, uh, at the end of January, Daniela Gerson, uh, from, she was at the, the LA Times, I, she's at a college now somewhere in California. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Uh, they created this thing where they were just going, they, they uh, curated a bunch of stories about immigration. Uh, they, they have various types of call outs. It's a, I think it's a, a really good example of, of creating something that is of the news right now that people are interested in and getting folks involved in this way. Um, but you, and there's different types of, there's things called tiny letters that you all can create very quickly without having to think, uh, go through a whole editorial process or spend a whole bunch of money to do something that you can do very lo-fi. Um, there's annotations. Uh, I'll skip because I have only a few more minutes. So when do you do this? Not every story necessarily needs this type, all of these different types of treatments. Not this story doesn't necessarily need a newsletter and a structured call out and a text campaign and a voicemail. Uh, you know, this is not a sense of saying like every story needs to involve the community every single time. Pick and choose what you're thinking about. Does your, you know, does the community itself, uh, is there an information gap within your investigation or within your beat that you're looking to fill? Is that information gap uh, sourcing? Is that information gap um, data? Is that information gap help in like going through documents? Uh, what is the thing that is missing from your beat or from your investigation that you think the community can help you with? The, the last line I think is a very important too, and particularly for crowdsourcing. If you're looking for story, folks who ha are harmed or ignored, especially ignored, they feel like they can't get their story out. Again, if you can provide an avenue for them to do that, and if it is within your beat, I think you, you more times, more times than not, you're going to have a fairly successful engagement project. Um, how to get started. Uh, these are very important. Every single time I start a project, these are the things that I think about. Who is the community that is most impacted? Who are the stakeholders? How do we reach them? Who might be able to help us? This is leveraging networks, right? So like maybe I don't have a whole bunch of contacts in the veteran community, but maybe the, the VFW hall in my community can in introduce me or put me in touch with folks. Maybe, um, you know, maybe the, the, the nonprofit about X, Y, or Z has some people that I can talk to, or a newsletter I can put my investigation in, or a Facebook page they might be able to share this thing on. Uh, I regularly think about how can I leverage networks that I am not currently a part of. Uh, what's the content plan? If your content plan is here's a structured call out and six months later I'm gonna write a story, 
that's, that's not where you want to be. You want to regularly think about what, between you launching a project and the end of the project, what is happening within those, you know, within that gap, right? Can you write more stories? Can you create more things? Um, and, you know, and how are you, and then to this last point, how are you then pushing it back out to the community? With crowdsourcing, with all of our projects at ProPublica, this is, this is integral to our strategy, right? I don't want just people to, to give us things. I want to be able to then push that thing back out to them. So it's all of the stories. It's all of the updates. If I have a question about, hey, veteran community, what Facebook groups do you participate in? I want you to tell me. That I send that question out, and then they tell me that thing back. I have one minute. Here's what you don't do. Don't ignore people who are participating. If they send you an email, simply send them an email back saying thanks. Sometimes that's all it takes. Uh, don't, uh, don't make the ask or, uh, it, uh, it, that's a inter, that's supposed to be interaction. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone who tweets that, tell them, to say I, I noticed it. Uh, feel like a transaction. Uh, and don't be ex extractive, right? This should not feel like I'm picking up um, prescriptions from a CVS. This should feel like I'm walking into a dinner party that I know everybody and I'm shaking their hands and I feel very warm and safe. You have to build that, but that's how it should feel. Um, here's some things that I've learned. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Here's some things that I learned. Do your research. Do your outreach, right? This is like reaching out to folks. Have a content plan, which I just mentioned. Find support within the newsroom. Who are the editors or other reporters who are interested in doing this thing? Maybe not the topic, but the idea, the sentiment, the methodology. Uh, find support in the community. Who is interested in helping you do that thing? Um, talk back to your community. That's creating that feedback loop. Uh, this is also just not social media and, uh, and distribution. This, to me, is a fundamental part of journalism. Uh, we ask questions all the time, and I think Julia said this, uh, but sometimes we do not, um, you know, we, 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 sometimes that avenue to participate, participate is just merely asking, and I think reporters don't think to do that within the structure of their story. They think to do that within the community and their notebook, but they don't think to do that, uh, they don't think to put that within their, their, their page themselves or the project themselves once they publish the thing. Uh, and I think this is really important. Uh, folks will help you out more than you think they will. Right? Uh, we've all been in that situation where we cover that first shooting or that first tragedy in a community and we're very apprehensive of going up to that family and saying, oh, uh, you know, like, tell me about this thing. Like, I, I experienced that. Uh, but when I finally did that, I realized that they, they actually wanted to tell me that story. And it's the same with a lot of these projects, that people want to talk. People generally want to talk. Um, and there's two th There's one simple takeaway is... Um, Simp I've said it like a bunch of times, simply provide that avenue. If you're, if, whatever that avenue may be, email, text, WhatsApp, Facebook group, structured call out, find a way to, make an, to, to build a road to your community. Uh, and then I'm just going to read this last thing, right? I think we're talking about trust uh, all the time. Amanda talked about it. Julia talked about it. I think this is incredibly important. I, I, I think that this came from Catherine Vinner. She wrote a, a piece in July. We are in the midst of a fundamental change in the values of journalism. When consumers shift, instead of strengthening social bonds or creating an informed public or the idea of news as a civic good, a, dem a democratic necessity, it creates gangs which spread instant falsehoods that fit uh, their views, reinforce each other's beliefs, driving each other deeper into shared opinions rather than established facts. I think the things that both Amanda, Julia, and I are talking about help combat this. They do not necessarily fix it. They don't change it, but it helps combat this by creating communities that trust the organizations that are actually talking to them. And finally, if you have any ideas, you can email me. <sighs> okay. Thank you. Am I done? Is that it? No questions? I ran out of time? Okay. Yes, we did a couple things. Uh, we put it in the front page. We used social media. We also found the nonprofit, the, the community organization within that community to, to um, put that on. I think we had to put it in their newsletter or, or print a short URL on their flyer, but we were able to, to, to get it to that place where the community, where some, where some of the thought leaders or, or, or you know, um, within that, that particular neighborhood uh, congregated or, 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 you know, kind of interacted with. Um, um, I can't remember. 
this was like four years ago, but I think it was, I, I think the reach of Pen Live was larger than the, 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 the reach of the, the community organization. Um, but still, both I think are equally important because what you end up finding is that you 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 find the most highly engaged folks would be the folks coming from that community organization, as opposed to people seeing like just you know this five question thing. I'm not saying they they weren't engaged, but I I can find probably somebody that I can work closer with who's coming from that news organ or that that nonprofit organization. Yeah. Mm hmm. No, no. Uh, we were trying to find folks who have been impacted by Agent Orange. And so I went to all veterans groups, right? Uh, so I wasn't looking for like, oh, let's find the group that says Agent Orange didn't affect Vietnam veterans. I was like, let's find the groups where v Vietnam veterans are. And many of them feel sprayed and betrayed. Uh, like, again, these structured callouts are not scientific surveys. They're clearly self you know, these are folks who say, oh, I have been impacted, and I'm going to fill, you know, fill out this form and tell you my story. So we're very aware of that. We don't claim that these are scientific, um, you know, scientific surveys in any capacity. And I, you know, we're not, we weren't looking for the, the, the veteran group that says, I love the VA, and they help me do the things that, they, that I need them to do, and here's the other side. Uh, if that group existed, I would have found it and participated in it, but that group doesn't exist. So... Um, I know in media and communications, having a really large email list of like an engaged audience is really important. You kind of answered it a bit when you said uh, pushing news back out to the people that uh -huh. contribute to. With the Agent Orange one, for example, you've got 7,000 people filling out a thing and they all give you their email address, I'm guessing. Yeah. What do you do with that in terms of do you like the mechanics? Do you like put it into the ProPublica email newsletter chain? Or no, no, no. We we have these se they they are their segments. This is actually something we're thinking about moving forward. Is how do we take segments and like introduce them to larger parts of ProPublica? But like for Agent Orange, that segment existed within the project, and so through through the the call out the form system that we use, Screen Door. Uh, every time we updated or had a question or whatever, we sent it to those 7,000, which was separate than the large daily newsletter, which is everything that comes from ProPublica. See, this was the, a small audience of 7,000 where this daily is like 76,000, but they're the most highly, they, they clearly are the most highly engaged in the thing that we're talking about. Over here, it's just anybody who came across ProPublica at some point in time. Right? I'm not going to get the same response of questions asked or whatever, or participation from 76,000 folks of a general audience uh, as opposed to 7,000 of a highly tuned, concentrated audience. But you're putting them into a news content feed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I manually, right? Every time something happens, I send them an email. Of, Hi, this is Terry from ProPublica. You know, it's very f uh, informal. I send an email like I'm sending, you know, uh, my grandmother or like a friend without the swear words, but like, you know, very informal conversational tone, soft skills. This is something that I think is really important too, is the soft skills of the whole thing, right? Like trying not to be extractive, not trying not to be transactional, but how am I talking to the folks that are participating in our projects in a, in a, in a human kind of a way? Good? Cool. If you have any questions, that's my email address or I'll have cards somewhere around, probably in the trash can. So uh, thank you. Thank you.